God and Father. And through the cross, he brought down upon us grace-filled gifts and all heavenly blessings. And he continues to write, and it's rather striking. I want us to pay attention. He goes on to say, but this is the Lord's cross itself. Each of us becomes a partaker of its salvific power in no other way than through our personal cross. When the personal cross of each of us is united with the cross of Christ, the power and the effect of the latter is transferred to us and becomes, as it were, a conduit through which every good gift and every perfect gift is poured forth upon us from the cross of Christ. From this, it is evident that the personal cross of each of us is as essential to the work of salvation as the cross of Christ. St. Theophan is telling us that it's not enough to pay attention to venerate the cross of our Lord. He's telling us that we also have to respect, almost revere the crosses, the struggles, the suffering that God has given to each one of us. Because we are sons and daughters of God through our baptism. Whenever a son or a daughter of God faithfully carries their cross, multitudes of people are sanctified and saved through these heroic acts. And it's in this way that each and every one has given us an opportunity to live the life of Christ, to choose the hard way, to deny ourselves, to make our only desire the will of the Father. St. John Chrysostom writes, through the cross, we learn the power of love and we are taught to die for others. So, we take stock, we take inventory of the difficulties, of the hardships, the suffering that you have been allowed by God that God has given to you and to me. And we be thankful. We have to be thankful for these crosses and trust that through perseverance and faithfulness, God can transform what is painful, what is difficult, whatever that thing is in your life into something amazing, something majestic. Oftentimes, we are completely overwhelmed by the things that God has put on our plates. We become discouraged. We despair. Some of us look for ways to escape. These situations that seem impossible. Maybe someone turns to a substance. Maybe someone turns to gaining attention from the opposite sex. Maybe someone turns to problematic online activity. Maybe someone becomes lazy and slothful. Maybe they turn into, they get into rabbit holes in social media. Maybe we focus on the sins of others, and so on. The thing is, these means of escape it never ends. It never ends if we take that path. Because our deep needs and desires can only be filled with the unlimited, infinite love that Christ has for each one of us. God sees your struggle. He knows your crosses. Sometimes we're done. We're done. And we look up to the heavens and we say, Lord, I can't do it any longer. I can't bear this cross. It's at this very moment that we are encouraged not to deny our crosses and run away from them. It's this moment that we're broken. The youth earlier this week, they took a moment to watch The Passion of the Christ, that famous movie. And there's a scene in the, in the Passion that 
when the when the actor is is carrying the cross, he kind of slips and stumbles, and he's like separated from the cross. It's a very powerful image. And then in that moment, he the actor he he embraces the cross. He looks for it and finds it and clings to it, almost hugs it. It's that brokenness. We have to have faith and focus our gaze on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the cross is a reminder of God's powerful sign of love. And we can ask the Lord for strength to carry our crosses with joy and with strength, trusting that even these present difficulties can be used for our salvation. It can be used for good. So the church is asking us to embrace our cross or our crosses. Each and every one who calls himself a Christian must take up the cross. Since we follow a master who chose the cross, we too must be ready to choose the cross. And this is hard. In our society, pain is always seen as bad. Pain is always something to be avoided at all costs. Think about what that would mean if our Lord Jesus Christ had a similar mentality. It means that he would never have been crucified or suffered for us. In our society, the goal is to avoid suffering. In Christianity, the Lord Jesus Christ does the complete opposite. He walks straight into all manner of pain and suffering, and he teaches us that we can't be saved if we run away from the difficult things in life. I'm going to say a quote from St. Mark the Ascetic. It's a very difficult quote. I'm almost afraid to read it. It's very, very powerful. St. Mark the Ascetic says, Unless a man gives himself entirely to the cross in a spirit of humility and self-abasement, unless he casts himself down to be trampled underfoot by all and despised, accepting injustice, contempt, and mockery, unless he undergoes all these things with joy for the sake of the Lord, not claiming any kind of human reward whatsoever, glory or honor or earthly pleasures, He cannot become a true Christian. We become true Christians through our embrace and our love for the cross of Christ, which is demonstrated perfectly through the embrace of our own crosses. Among the most deceitful lies in our world today is a lie that we should do whatever we want in life. We should chase after pleasure and self-fulfillment. We should have everything that we want. And the beauty of the gospel is that this it corrects our way of thinking and seeing and exposes us to the truth and the light if we're willing to accept it. The world tells us not to suffer, not to deny ourselves anything that we want. Chase your desires. Follow your urges. Don't hesitate. Everything can be yours. You can have it all. Yet our Lord Jesus Christ says something different. And to each one of us, we have to seriously choose who or what we will honor and follow with our lives and our choices. We don't worship multiple gods. If you remember what Elijah the prophet says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, he says, and came to the people and said, How long do you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. People were quiet. So as Christians, it's up to us to take this call to follow Christ seriously. Our crosses are are difficult. There's no doubt about it. And sometimes we barely feel like we can carry them without us falling over, stumbling on our faces. Parenthood could be a cross. Marriage can be a cross. Being single or celibate 
can be a cross. Working and going to school in our society can be a cross. Staying at home to raise kids can be a cross. Dynamics with our family members could be a cross. Dynamics with our friends could be a cross. Illnesses can be a cross. Accidents can be a cross. Financial hardships could be a cross. And we can feel the weight of these crosses push us down. Life can be very difficult. We don't know if we can survive some of the crosses that we've been given in life. I was struck with one of the comments of St. John Chrysostom when we read from the exposition of the sixth hour of the eve of Thursday. St. John Chrysostom said, There is evil which is really evil, fornication, adultery, covetousness, and countless dreadful things which are worthy of the utmost reproach and punishment. But there is evil which is not evil but called so. Famine, pestilence, death, disease, and others of a similar nature, these are not evils. I just called them for this explanation. Why not? Because if they were evil, they would not become the source of good. Chastening our pride, guarding our laziness, and leading us to zeal, making us more attentive. Sometimes we call things crosses that are not crosses, and we call things that are not crosses, crosses. The argument here is that anything that puts us to our knees is a cross. They can be a source for good. They humble us. Anything. Our Lord gives us hope. By carrying his cross to the end, he demonstrates how a sacrificial offering of one's life out of love can change the course of history. And that could be the way for all of us here when we carry our various crosses. So how do we wrap our minds around embracing our crosses? I'm going to share a story that I came across. I did not come up with this story. It goes, a woman calls her mother on the phone. Mom, I just had some tests done at the doctor's office. And for the next few months, it looks like I'm going to be getting really, really sick. And among other problems, the doctor says I can expect high blood pressure, back pain, nausea, and weight gain. The mom replies, oh no. What did he say that you have? He said, I'm going to have a baby. That's not usually how the phone call goes, right? Normally, we expect the conversation to go something like this. Mom, great news. I just found out that I'm going to have a baby. Oh, honey, that's wonderful. Honey. Congratulations. That's more what we would expect. Mother and daughter both know what's coming. They're both very aware of the morning sickness. They're both very aware of the back pain. They know we have to watch our blood pressure. They know all these things, and they don't have to mention any of it because they are so excited for the new baby. They know suffering will be involved, but they don't even mention any of that because they know the suffering is tiny in comparison to the amazing reward of having a precious new child. What would be sorrow has turned into joy. If it wasn't for that baby, you'd look at those months in a completely different light. If the woman said, I was sick and throwing up for months and my back was hurting and I gained 40 pounds, making all these trips to the doctor, if the baby was not involved, you would be really worried about her. You look at this as a horrific trial in her life. But when you know the reward is a baby, you don't even think about the pain. You don't even think about the suffering because you're looking forward to the joy of holding that baby in your arms. I want to read from you the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verses 20 through 24. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, for the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she had given birth to a child, 
She no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. In these five verses, the word joy was repeated four times. Joy, 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 joy. Your sorrow will be turned into joy. What are we to make of passages like this? In the Gospel of St. John, he's saying joy is coming, but you're going to have to go through some sorrow to get there. What are we to make of passages like the Epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now there's a tough command. The last time that temptations were sent your way, did you respond with joy? Did you count it all joy when you had to suffer? The scripture says that we should. Joy comes as reward for the suffering, and that joy is what makes suffering bearable. But Abuna, what about physical suffering? That's different. That's a different category. Migraines and headaches and, and back pain and hip pain. How does that help us? One way that it helps us is that it reminds us that we're dying. You say, I don't want to think about that. That's why it's good for you to think about that. When your body starts to fall apart like mine, when things don't work the way that they used to work, when you are no longer this invincible 18-year-old with muscles, you start to realize, I'm going to die. And it's good to be reminded of your death so that you can repent. It's good to be reminded of your death so that you can go to confession today. So that you and God can deal with those sins today so that you don't have to deal with them on that day. Physical suffering like headaches, Back pain, these things remind us that we're dying. It reminds us that judgment day is approaching. It reminds us that we are not supermen and women. And most importantly, it humbles us if we allow it to. When you're 25 and you're strong with big muscles, you can run for an hour without getting tired. It's really difficult to avoid pride. And pride is the most single dangerous thing in the universe. And if you don't have it, the devil and his minions cannot hurt you. Physical suffering humbles us. It's not a curse from God. We're not cursed when we're suffering physically. That's the grace of God that gives us whatever we need to encourage us in the direction of humility. It's the grace of God. Physical suffering helps to conform us to the image of Christ, to learn obedience by the things that he suffered. So the next time that we have physical suffering, yes, go to the doctor. Yes, pray for deliverance. But in the meantime, rejoice. Give thanks because it's not in vain. That physical suffering that you are enduring is not for nothing. It's not meaningless. It's not useless. God is using it for good. It's working for your good to conform you to the image of Christ, to humble you, to make you more like him, to remind you that of your death so that you can repent and we give thanks to God for this. We rejoice. Maybe some of us can accept that, the physical suffering. But what about emotional suffering? No, no, that's a different category. Loneliness and rejection and frustration with people that you thought were your friends and then they don't stick with you. This helps us. This too can be a gift from God if we receive it correctly. Emotional suffering reminds us that we are not self-sufficient. Even if you are in perfect health, the question is, can you be happy by yourself? Only for so long. 
We need other people. We need relationships. We need to be in the body of Christ. This reminds us to be kind to other people so that we don't make them feel that way. Maybe you have caused someone to feel lonely and rejected and frustrated and upset or angry. Maybe you did that. And you may not understand what's so wrong with the way that you're behaving until you yourself are on the receiving end of that. So educational. This is to help you. This is to give you an opportunity to repent. So once again, when you're going through emotional suffering, it's an amazing opportunity for God to humble us. Our Lord suffered these things, these kinds of sufferings. He was abandoned by his disciples. He was rejected by people that he came to save. He was mocked. He was cursed. He was shamed. He was spit on. And we say we want to be like Christ. Then, of course, we have to walk a similar path. None of the suffering is in vain. None of it. Joy is born out of sorrow. Joy vanquishes sorrow. And true joy cannot be taken away from you. Our Lord also says that your joy needs to be made full. And for your joy to be made full, you need to realize that you're suffering for a reason. To believe what it says in Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God. That means that your migraines work together for, for the good of those who love God. That your back pain, your hip pain, work together for the good of those who love God. That your emotional suffering, that your loneliness, your rejection, your frustration with people works together for the good of those who love God. Don't fall into despair when you suffer. When you suffer, rejoice, knowing that you are going through it for a reason and that you will receive your reward in the right time. We need to be, we need to be people of faith. Where is our trust? We can't stop halfway carrying the cross. We're called to carry the cross to completion, not halfway. If you remember in the book of Ruth, there was an amazing scene when Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth, they were walking back. They were taking a trip back home. And, Orf and Naomi turns to her, da her daughters-in-law and says, what are you doing with me? What do you, what do you want from me? And she gave them the way out. If you want to leave, leave. If you don't want to carry this cross, go ahead. And Orpha, she does a sweet thing. She kisses her mother-in-law on the cheek and says goodbye. But Ruth, what did she say? It's an amazing lesson of faithfulness. She said to her mother-in-law, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from me following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. I wish we can say this in the face of our crosses. Our salvation is bound up in being steadfast and faithful to whatever God has given us. And it's through our patience and sacrificial love that our Lord transforms these things into joy and life. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. So we have to let go. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Let him deny himself. We each have struggles and difficulties and crosses in our lives. And some are very painful. I'm not trying to minimize that. But what is the thought process that we go through when we encounter our difficulties? Our Lord tells us to deny ourselves. And he goes so far to kind of say, 
that our denial will not only be painful, but it will actually be the beginning of our crucifixion. If we don't die to ourselves, we cannot be resurrected to life in Christ. It seems crazy for us to speak this way, yet our Lord does not say much that is sane by our modern standards. He says, love God, love your neighbor, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, give without asking for return, and the list goes on. Denial is the life of the Christian. The Lord denied himself in order to be lowered to our human condition. He denied himself by being accused and murdered unjustly as a criminal. A complete denial led to the true revelation of who Christ really is. We, in turn, must be ready to deny ourselves completely. He denied himself to save us. He denied himself justice. He denied himself the chance to escape. He denied himself a comfortable and quiet life. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Those are very difficult words to follow. Live in comfort, luxuriousness. It's really difficult for us to understand what it means to deny ourselves of anything. Look at the struggles just in fasting. Focusing on the cross is a gift. Have you ever thought of suffering as a privilege? It's true. Listen to the words of St. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Instead of complaining, I can take a few moments of my day, say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to share in your sufferings, even in a very, very small way. Then we begin to get used to the suffering of our Lord, and he gives us an even greater gift. He allows us to share in more than his suffering. He allows us to share in his resurrection, in the glory of the resurrection. Lent and Holy Week is a very short version of our entire spiritual life. It's a time for us to learn how to die to ourselves and to live in Christ. It's a time for us to, re- to turn towards the suffering of the cross as our Lord Christ did. We have to run to the cross with courage because we understand that God is with us when we suffer. Nothing can be more comforting than that. We understand that only the cross brings salvation. We understand that without our crosses, we can have no resurrection. Each and every one of us is already wishing for the Feast of the Resurrection. We're thinking about our celebration. We're thinking about our plans, our meals. And our Lord reminds us that there's no magical or pain-free, glamorous way to arrive to the resurrection. The only way is to the empty tomb requires self-denial. The only way to the resurrection is a difficult, painful, humiliating path. The way to the resurrection is blocked by the cross. So to conclude, the cross is a sign of suffering and shame and ugliness and injustice and weakness. It's a sign of death. The cross is a sign of everything that is wrong in the world. But that's not what it means to us. Because the Lord Christ faithfully confronts the cross, it has been transformed for us. The cross is a symbol of beauty and love and faithfulness and life. Through the cross, joy has come into the world. The cross becomes our strength because through it, Christ makes us strong. The cross becomes our life because through it, our Lord defeats death. The cross becomes our one enduring reminder that when the world is lonely and dark and a difficult place, there is still one who loves us and his love never ends. The cross reminds us that when a man is truly weak, God has the power to use this weakness and turn it into strength. St. Paul writes, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us 
who are being saved, it is the power of God. The power of God is at work in the lives of those who live by the message of the cross. The cross is at work even now as we are struggling through life. And I hope that's an inspiration for each one of us. We need to seek the path of Christ. His path is a journey to a real life. How blessed are we that although we are so insignificant, the Lord invites us to follow him, to become partakers, not only of the cross, but of the joy and the power of his resurrection. He is truly the lover of mankind. May the Lord bless your struggle, our struggle, and give us courage to carry our crosses and to follow his footsteps, not only to Golgotha, but to even to the empty tomb and life eternal. And glory be to God forever. Amen.